Welcome alumni, education, students, and parents to our Q&A with the School of, of Education's third Dean, Francis Contreras. My name is Frank Olmos. I'm honored to serve as president of our Anteaters in Education alumni chapter. My co-host for our event is chapter vice president, Tracy Carmichael. Please note that, to, that our program today is being recorded and the recording will be available after the event. All right, without further ado, let's get this show started. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dean Frances Contreras, who joined UCI in January 2022. She comes to UCI from UC San Diego, where she served as Associate Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, as well as Professor of Educational Studies. Contreras is a UC alumni, alumni earning a bachelor's degree at UC Berkeley, master's degree from Harvard University and PhD in education from Stanford University. Her research focuses on diversity and access for underrepresented students and the role of public policy in ensuring student equity. Her work has been published in leading education journals. Her books include Achieving Equity for Latino Students, The Latino Education Crisis and High Achieving African American Students, and the college choice process. She has been recognized as an emerging scholar and among the top 25 US academicians to watch by Diverse Magazine. So here you go. It's all you, Dean Francis Contreras. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me this evening for this important discussion. I wanna start off by um, using a land acknowledgement. I'm not actually sure if it's the formal land acknowledgement, but it's important to note that the UC Irvine campus is located on the homelands of the Ashaman and Tongva peoples who continue to claim their place as stewards of this land and their ancestral lands as they have for the past 8,000 years. It's really important in my work to acknowledge place and space. And I just wanted to honor um, this community in particular as we start our conversation. I also want to acknowledge um, the Ukrainian people and acknowledge the humanitarian crisis that is um, really unfolding uh, before our eyes in Ukraine. Um, I wanna offer, of course, my thoughts and my prayers for those of you that have families, have relatives, have ties to the region, and also for all of us who are grappling with how to explain the series of events, not only to our children, but to one another. I'm really honored to join this incredible community of scholars um, at UC Irvine um, and begin this new chapter in my career as the next Dean of the School of Education. Of course, I wanna thank the two previous deans um, for their work um, and their incredible tenacity to building the school to what it is today. Um, I am inspired by the conversations I have had. I've now met with 86% of all of our faculty. In my first uh, 90 days, of course, it was a really important approach for me to meet with everyone. I'm in day 60 as of today, and I can say I've met with many teams of staff. I've met with colleagues. I met with many of you that are community partners already and look forward to many more conversations. Um, but what I have come away with from all of those conversations is just the incredible commitment that each of us share, not only to our research and our craft and our leadership roles and efforts, but we are also equally committed to changing the lives of those around us, particularly students. And it is an honor to join you here today. I look forward to the discussion tonight um, and learning about many of the questions you might have for me as the next Dean of the School of Education at UC Irvine. Great, thank you, Dean Contreras. The format of our discussion will be a Q&A focusing on four areas. Dr. Contreras' background, her vision for the school, the role of alumni and participant questions which were submitted through the reservation link. And we hope that the discussion provides you with some insights into our amazing new Dean, future directions for the school and innovations in the field during this challenging time. Tracy will lead our first topic on Dean Contreras's personal background. So I'll turn it over to Tracy. Thank you, Frank. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Dean Contreras, for being here. Um, I think myself, among many others, are just curious to know who you are as a person. So I wanted to give you this opportunity to tell us a little bit about where you grew up. 
Thank you so much. Um, so many of you already might know this from the videos and the incredible press rollout that um, Ryan Hadowski has put together for our school. Um, but I grew up in the city of Norwalk and um, really spent my entire life. My parents still live in my childhood home. And the running joke is that they brought me home as a baby. And so that was the first house I've ever known. And they're still located in that house, which um, we all like to consider is full of love and full of this sense of pride. Um, and so growing up in Norwalk, I, I of course witnessed and experienced schools um, in my local community, um, but always resonated with the message that my parents gave to us, which was to really work hard um, and to be engaged and involved and to know that your success is synonymous with giving back. So that's a long winded answer, answer to where I grew up, yeah. but we still very much are all part of this community, my siblings and myself. I come from a family of six. I have um, three additional siblings and we are all located um, in this area and, and leading in our own right. So it's really a privilege to come back home um, for all intents and purposes to serve the community in which I grew up and to lead in this space alongside all of you. Yeah, it's, it's gotta feel a little full circle in that way, right? Absolutely. Um, so in, in growing up, you know, all of us have people that influence um, our lives and our career trajectories. So can you tell us a little bit about who in your sphere um, influenced you to be where you're at today? Well, first, of course, I have to start off with my parents, um, right? Your first teachers, my first teachers were my parents, Gilbert and Celia Contreras. Mm -hmm. They were um, coaches. They were spelling bee coaches, right? I was always in the spelling bee. Um, they really were my first teachers and mentors. But as I continued along my educational trajectory, of course, as a first generation student at UC Berkeley, I quickly found that um, this was a whole new educational space right, going to UC. And I think many of our first generation students might feel that I might experience that. And so I quickly found leaders and professors and advisors that I could resonate with. And one of them in particular in my undergraduate years was Dr. Francisco Hernandez. He was the highest ranking Latinx scholar, Latino scholar, Chicano Latino scholar at UC Berkeley. And I remember going to an event and asking him how, what pathway did he take um, to um, engage in his role as a vice chancellor. Um, and so my eye was always on individuals that looked like they had really good and fulfilling jobs, right? They look like it was right. so much fun. I saw them at every event. I saw them at many receptions. And as a student, you're looking at, for those receptions. And I quickly took to him to understand his pathway. And that's when I started to learn what a PhD was. And in that one interaction led to several other mentors, right? I had nonprofit mentors. Um, he and others at the UC Berkeley campus guided me to think about nonprofit experiences that would be fulfilling and internships, the value of internships, that making your summers count is incredibly important. And that's a message I carry with me today for our undergraduates, that your summers really do have to count because you're building on your reputation, you're building your skill set. Um, and so I worked for some think tanks called the Green Lining Institute that worked against redlining practices. I worked for Latino Issues Forum and um, met wonderful mentors, uh, John Gamboa and Roberto Otto, who really taught me about this nonprofit space and sphere. And that was really, really important in my career trajectory. And met scholars like Patricia Gandra, who to this day are very influential. But one other mentor at Cal, I feel like I really come full circle because she was my undergraduate McNair mentor, and that's Dr. Rachel Moran. Rachel is a law professor at UC Irvine, but was also the dean at the UCLA School of Law. And she was my McNair mentor when I was 19 years old. And so to be, and, and I'm not sure if you all know the structure, you probably do, your alumni, that the School of Education and the School of Law share a space. And mm -hmm. so to be in the same space as my undergraduate mentor um, is just really something that's special. And um, yeah, and I just can't, I can't uh, describe the, the feelings of emotion when she reached out to me to congratulate me. Um, and all those years ago, our conversations as a McNair mentor, um, how I have come full circle. And I'm really grateful for those relationships, those interactions. And I still keep in touch with many of them. They're now 
you know, very much part of my research, you know, interactions and agenda, mm -hmm. and still mm -hmm. definitely keep in touch with scholars like Patricia Gandra, who's definitely guided my way as a postdoctoral scholar. So mm -hmm. I can go on and on about mentors, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about the mentors that have influenced me in my scholarship. But, um, you know, one of the priorities that resonates with me in their approach is that they continuously give back and are generous with their time. Mm -hmm. And that generosity with their time and their expertise is, um, you know, it's a value that we collectively possess and need to do more of with the next generation. Yeah. It, I mean, it truly is a homecoming. You have just a small bridge keeping you away from one of your most influential right. people in your life. That's, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of home, when you get, you know, five minutes to yourself, if that ever happens, what do you listen to or watch? Do you have a favorite podcast or show or are you reading a book currently that you'd like to share with us? So I am, I, I really like KQED's Mind Shift. Mm -hmm. I, I love their, it's, it's a public, public podcast, but Mind Shift is all about education and educational reform. Um, and one of the articles, for example, one of the podcasts I was, I was looking at recently was a podcast called Retaining and Sustaining Black Teachers. And so I always feel like I learn something new with this podcast. Um, and not that I have a lot of time for podcasts, but this is one that I do pay attention to those that are related to school reform, those that are related to equity, um, that give me insight on how to inspire the next generation mm -hmm. of scholars, um, and also tackle, right. The unique problems of the day. And so that's one mind shift that mm -hmm. I really look forward to, um, in terms of reading, I'm actually doing a lot about of reading related to, um, executive leadership. Mm -hmm. right? So you learn as you do, but I think right, it's also right. helpful to learn some of the books that I've read pr to prepare for this role were like preparing for your 90 day, you know, the 90 day plan. Um, but one of the books I'm reading right now is related to um, an executive coach that I have, and that's How Women Rise and, um, and some of the lessons from other women leaders um, and wisdom that they are imparting through this book. Mm -hmm. I think I'll, I'll close out this section as with a, what I call a magic wand question. If you had to be in another career path, uh, what would you choose? Wow. Ask me an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> dream, dream world. <laughs> right. You know, I, okay. So my backup plan, I will say was to be a caterer and a chef. And so mm -hmm. I think it really resonates with this idea of sharing and breaking bread and feeding people this idea of service. That is one area. And then I honestly think I would be a classroom teacher because I thoroughly enjoy te uh, teaching and I thoroughly enjoy children. So mm -hmm. the pairing of the two seems like a dream job. Um, so I'm still connected to the teacher, right? Just at a different yes. level, but I think I would have gone uh, at a younger level. So it's either between chef and a teacher would have been my um, alternate careers for sure. Thank you, thank you. Frank, I'll hand it back to you for our next section. Thank you, Tracy. So we're gonna be transitioning to the next area of discussion and topic is school vision and research. And then, and it's great that you shared about being mentored and all these, uh, all these other resources and books that you've been interested in. But I'm, we're very curious to know what inspired you to come to UC Irvine? Right. You know, the, the UC Irvine School of Education is already a strong leader in this space right, both on campus and in the Orange County region. And when I, um, I was actually being approached by a number of campuses because there were some openings in the past two years. And I remember, you know, thinking, no, this might not be the best place for me. It might not be the best space. And then when Irvine came around, it was number four. And I just thought this is an opportunity I have to throw my hat in because I read about the faculty, I read, I read their research actually regularly um, and had read a number of the research and I'm aware of a number of scholars in the school and just felt that I resonated with their work ethic. I resonated with their commitment to community, right? When I think about ocean, when I think about um, the early childhood education researchers and their impact that they're having every day on policy and early childhood policy real time. Um, I was just incredibly honored and thought that this was a community I could not only um, participate in, right, as a leader, but beyond being a leader, would want to stay, right, would want to stay and be on the faculty. And so when you have that mix of being inspired by the research that your colleagues are doing, 
and then have the opportunity to build on an already solid foundation, it really did um, appear to me to be a dream job. And after 60 days, I will still concur that it's still a dream job. <laughs> so um, I think I'm in a good place in terms of thinking about um, and, and moving forward in a space where people value the work that each of us are doing and are committed to one another's success. That's great that you share that this is your dream job because it, it really influences the day-to-day -day work and productivity and, and your commitment and the commitment of others that surround you. And so with that, I, I think leads to the next question is in terms of what are the greatest challenges in education today and are we equipped to handle them? So are we as a school or as we collectively? I think we're, I think that that's the big question. And, and um, I'm gonna answer it by starting with some opportunities, right? And then we'll get at the challenges. Cause I think a lot of schools of education are laying out. These are our grand challenges. These are, you know, the challenges. One, it's important to acknowledge that this is a very difficult time for the world and a very difficult time coming off of the COVID pandemic. So this is kind of the overarching climate. But I think we have several opportunities for engaging youth and in this moment, redefining what we mean by equity, what we mean by access, um, what we you know, mean in terms of ensuring that the value and quality of an education um, still exists for everyone, right? That, that the American dream still belongs to every one of us. And I think that those are the opportunities that I'd like to outline for this group in particular. Um, and so I, I will come back to some of those challenges, but I wanted to just name one in this COVID moment that it is a, there is a particular moment where we have this space to redefine um, what it means. Like going back to these conversations that we've had, um, many of you are parents on the call and, and, and in this space, you probably heard, you know, kindergarten is the new first grade second grade is the new third grade. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, as a parent, I have two children in elementary school. When did everything become so ratcheted up? And there are things that we actually could leave behind that I would be okay with um, in our return to, right, in-person instruction, our return to in-person life. Um, and that's definitely one of them that we have learned to um, engage and challenge one another differently. Mm -hmm. So a couple of the opportunities I want to outline is this opportunity to connect systems of education, right? This opportunity to connect the P20 continuum in a way as a school of education, I believe we have the capacity to do. This is a very strong faculty um, and students and our staff are all excellent in terms of their shared commitment to really thinking about our own individual agency and how we can inform debates and, um, and the field really in this space. And so connecting the P20 systems of education is something that I think we have a very strong aptitude for as a school. Um, paying attention to cognitive development at all levels. We have a phenomenal group of um, human development and psychologists. We have an incredible group that pays attention to how we learn. Um, the cognitive development, neuroscience um, elements of learning. And this is a strong suit of our school. And it's ever, you know, it's increasingly important as we have relied on different modes of learning, right? That we have, bec we have really become to come to understand that um, learning using technology can happen, that it may not be the same, it might not look the same, but that quality has been, that there are levels of quality we can deliver remotely. And also pairing with that hybrid work management has been part of our new reality as well. Mm -hmm. So that's another opportunity that we have. Um, technology and data. Now more than ever, right? Is this, mm -hmm. everyone calls it the data revolution and it has been deemed in the field this data revolution. You know, one of the areas that I've been incredibly impressed by is how um, several of my colleagues in the School of Education stepped up to serve as um, experts and offer their expertise for the rest of the campus. Not many schools of education can say that they offered a level of expertise in helping to transition the faculty of a university to remote learning. Mm -hmm. And in this space, the School of Education did that. Um, and they are highly regarded and respected. And help to engage the school in discourse around critical pedagogy online, mm -hmm. right? And that's something that um, we really have um, expertise 
in, in doing. Um, and so that's another opportunity that I see as addressing some of those challenges, right? So the challenge is access to technology, but the answer is how do we use technology equitably? How do we ensure, for example, and, and offer voice to, yes, everyone had access to some form of technology to engage in Zoom, but in particular areas of the state, was giving an iPad the same as giving a MacBook, right? And we need to ask ourselves those questions. You know, what, what your children may have had as college graduates and my children may have had in terms of access, right, to a mom who's a professor um, is qualitatively different than those first generation students or those students that were working alongside their parents, for example, in the fields. So just being, being cognizant of these different lived realities is equally important. Diverse educators. Another opportunity that answers the challenge of diversity is to ensure that our educators at all levels are diverse, um, that they are empowered, that we're listening to the voices of our educators, particularly in this moment when we're seeing incredible challenges to um, the educational system. We are, we're continuously talking about what we're considering, what we see as an exodus of teachers in the field. How do we ensure that our educators are inspired that they see UC Irvine as contributing to the lifespan of the teacher, that we are an academic home for them. And we're a home beyond their degree. We're a home beyond them achieving that terminal degree um, and are a place they can come back to for not only professional development, but for community. And then finally, this big overarching um, opportunity is to really be a voice for equity, to be a voice for, um, allowing, not, not allowing, but ensuring that we in our own spheres of influence are promoting equity with everything that we do, um, with um, everything from the courses that we teach to um, the programs that we enact and develop, thinking about how we're ensuring equity at every level and challenging um, conceptions of equity that um, reinforce the status quo. And so equity is, is really at the forefront. And with that, you know, is identity and acknowledging identity and allowing multiple voices at the table. And so equity is a really broad opportunity that we have as a school of education to really think about the future and think about um, how we might consider these P20 systems re-examine approaches to equity at all levels, everything from teacher pay to um, the pedagogy and, and critical pedagogy with that. So I'm going to stop there in case yeah. you have other questions. Just small tasks, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, no, I appreciate the, that response. I mean, the, we're talking about, you know, as you mentioned, the commitment, the, the talent, the, the, you know, cognitive development and, and, and the equity aspect of, of the education system. I mean, it, these are very all relevant and important areas. Uh, the question I, I would have, for you then is how do you plan to leverage outside sources, partnerships, organizations to, mm -hmm. to achieve these objectives? That's great. That's a great follow-up question. And the, the short answer is, and I'll unpack it a bit, is to prioritize authentic engagement, right? That we're prioritizing authentic engagement. We are working with local schools. Ocean's a good example, but we also have several of our early childhood researchers we have several of our researchers that are engaged in technology at the higher education level, for example, working with our districts, our community colleges, um, and being an authentic partner, right? That we are at the table, that we step up with our resources and our expertise as active partners in this process. Many of our colleagues, my colleagues are writing grants um, related to how to improve, you know, processes for our students, how to improve learning and pedagogy, you know, at, at any spectrum. And so to think about how we're engaging with scholars, how we're engaging with our community partners is going to be equally important. And so authentic engagement is, is really critical and really key. We also have the Center for Educational Partnerships. It's in, now in its 25th year. The fact that this unit is a part of, very much a part of the fabric of the School of Education is to our benefit right? That they already have been doing this work for 25 years. They are engaged with school districts. They are doing the active tutoring. And how do we ensure that the Center for Educational Partnerships is set up to thrive, right? I see the Dean's role in, in all of this work as creating the conditions for not only our faculty, but our staff and our students 
to thrive and essentially reach their full potential. And I say the same for our partnerships, right? That many of our partnerships, I'd like to deepen those partnerships. Um, I'd like to lend the expertise of, of our collective faculty um, when it makes sense and also expand on the already excellent work that's happening with, with our partnerships like Ocean. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to end this topic by asking you that, you know, hearing your personal story, hearing your background, it seems very personal, like your education is a personal thing. And it, it seems that it's a, it's a driving force. Is, is that the case? Is that, the, is that what inspires you on a day-to-day -day basis is just to make things better for, for all students, uh, you know, of all various types of backgrounds? Right. That's a great question. And I mean, of course, the answer is yes. I really believe that education, you know, does offer communities generational mobility. I think that UC Irvine has the potential to be the place and, and offer space where um, generations can be developed and cultivated. Generations of scholars can be cultivated and developed. And this is my life's work. And so I feel very committed to you know, ensuring that as we're engaging with partners or as we're engaging with students, that um, that we are really ensuring that the next generation is better off, right, than the previous generation. Um, and so, you know, whether it be connecting to our first generation students or enacting programs for our PhD students or you know, raising resources for fellowships so that we increase the pipeline of those coming from community colleges all the way through their doctorate. You know, thinking about a broad agenda where we're maximizing our impact, where we're doing the most with what we have to ensure that we have um, an imprint that is lasting, a legacy that's lasting in the region and in the state. And I really think that we can create this model and already have created a model, honestly, um, to impact not only the region, but the state. And, you know, it, it, it goes, you know, a long way to say that it's, it's really important that we also reconceptualize what schools of education can be, that they can be more than hubs of learning, mm -hmm. that they really are, um, you know, an important space, not mm -hmm. only for active learning, active engagement, but also active partnership. And I frankly learned as much as much from our community partners as, as I'm able to impart a level of wisdom. And so those lessons, those life lessons, listening to teachers on the ground, mm -hmm. listening to local community college presidents of their realities, um, that's where we need to be. That's where we need to be. And it's in that messiness of those conversations where innovation really does happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to now turn it over. Thank you, Dean. I'm going to turn it over to Tracy for more questions about alumni, how to connect the alumni to the School of Education. Go ahead, Tracy. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your your vision um, and your your strategy, so to speak, Dean Contreras. I think um, you know I'm an alumni. Frank's an alumni. We're both part of the um, School of Ed alumni chapter, and we're proud members of that. Um, but there has to be a place for alumni to help move these visions forward, right? And you used a term cross-generational alumni engagement in one of our previous conversations. And so I wanted you to kind of just unpack that a little bit by what you mean by how alumni can help move this, this vision forward. Right, right. Well, first, I want to say thank you for that question. And also point out, if I haven't already, that I really firmly believe a vision is shared. And so coming in, it's, you know, I have made it a point to really listen and to learn and to be a student of the school. Um, and I'm gonna continue on that path um, probably throughout the throughout my term actually, <laughs> um, but, but um, definitely in this first 120 days, it's really important for me to listen and hear um, the shared vision that, that individual constituents have, but also that collective, you know, collective students and programs have as well. Um, and so because I firmly believe a vision is shared, it's evolving. Right, that it's not one person's vision that's top down. It's oftentimes the best visions that are enacted are those that happen ground up um, and happen out of a passion and a need for change. So, with that, you know, engaging the alumni is definitely a priority for me um, in terms of engaging them with the school, having cross generational learning, um, right, bringing back some of our. Um, more senior teachers now to influence our MAT program, our teacher academy, so that we're actually dialoguing with one another about the state of education. Um, I also believe that historical context is important. 
And so that cross-generational learning is, is really where I think the magic can happen um, in terms of shared learning. Um, we're also, I feel really fortunate because we're also embarking on our 10th year. So mm -hmm. here I am as a new dean coming in in a festive year. Um, mm -hmm. And if anyone on the call knows me uh, and my background, I absolutely love to host. And I love to break bread. Um, remember that was a backup career. That's and right. so, <laughs> being a caterer. Um, and so, you know, when I think about um, the opportunities that exist in this 10th year, it will be to engage with the alumni. It, I would love events to um, engage with our alumni. Hosting salon events would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Hosting events, um, coming to our conversations our teacher academy programs. We have a number of teacher academy programs. We'd love to have you for maybe a lunch series where you are now, based on where you are, where you were mm -hmm. then um, to converse with some of our existing students about your own career trajectories. Because I think we all have um, something to learn and something to gain from our shared lived experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and then we of course have, you know, I love your insight on, um, you know, the changing state of where you are in education. Mm -hmm. um, we also have the Dean's Leadership Society. It would be fantastic if you were to join the Dean's Leadership Society, or as I mentioned, participate in a number of panels, career panels for our current education students. So there's quite a bit. Um, if you approach us, we will definitely put you to work. <laughs> and we will definitely, we will definitely engage you in a number one of these events. But Again, this is a 10 year. And so it's also a time to celebrate where mm -hmm. the School of Education has been to honor those faculty that have been part of the school, right? For this past decade that have helped to build the school, right? I really believe it's important to acknowledge their tenacity mm -hmm. and their hard work that has gone into building a school of this recognition, this level of recognition and this um, incredibly strong reputation. And so it's a time to reflect, but it's also equally a time to look forward. And mm -hmm. I would love to engage you in those conversations about, you know, related to dreaming, dreaming about what the future of our school could look like, dreaming about what the future of the school should be and how we should be serving the local community, but also broadly how we should be looking to create um, a model school of education um, that can really have an impact more broadly. As, as an example of um, the importance of stepping up and offering our resources, offering our expertise and offering our partnership. That's right, that's right. You know, and I, so double alum um, with BA and came back a good eight mm -hmm. or 10 years later for the, for the doctoral program and the, um, the shift in the um, status and the, um, the push of the school was incredible. And I think part of the, um, opportunity we have as alumni is to make people aware of the School of Education as it is now, because um, we have a strong, engaged um, following. So letting, you know, catching them up to speed on everything, I think. And, and the few events that, that you listed uh, are great opportunities. I'll take this minute to do a shameless plug for the Ant Eaters and Education Alumni Group. It's a fun group. Uh, we, we celebrate, we get some work done, we raise scholarship dollars. Um, so there's a, there's a lot to be done and we're, we're always open to new members and new ideas. So um, we'll be giving you some information along, along the way, but, but thank you for that because it's important to have a leader who appreciates the, the alumni feedback um, throughout. So thank you. Um, Frank, I think that that was a good menu of services for alumni. So I think we could move on to the, to the audience questions. Great, yes. thank you, thank you. All right, so we're moving on to the audience questions. We received a number of questions. We, we tried our best to include all of them. We put them in categories and we tried to create at least a subset of questions that we're able to ask our Dean here. So uh, the first question we have from the audience is that COVID is creating a learning, learning loss across the nation, partic particularly amongst underrepresented students. What is UCI doing to train its future teachers to combat this? Mm hmm. So, you know, I, I think that one, I, I think there's a problem in, in calling um, the impact of COVID as learning loss, because I think, you know, being a mom of two elementary school children, I think our children learned a lot from this time. I think they learned a lot about resilience. I think they themselves have um, learned uh, a great deal. And so I, I understand what the question means, but I, I think it's just important to acknowledge that learning still happened, right? Parents still were, you know, 
doing their best and, and trying to follow the, the stated curriculum that teachers provided, you know, so, so, but I think that in terms of our teacher education program, we just have this incredible teacher education program and team like hands down. And so I think where we are in our, in a, our school is we're also at a crossroads in terms of the potential and growth of our teacher education program. Um, that we have an opportunity to redefine and reshape like who we want to be next and how we want to engage with future teachers. How can we step up again, as I noted, to contribute to the lifespan of the teacher? Um, how do we become a place of the shared learning of how teachers have responded? Because I think in this moment, we have asked our teachers to really become the support systems for families, the support systems for students, um, making up for whatever technological access did or didn't exist. Um, and so teachers, honestly, were not working their standard, right, um, workload by far, um, which has led to levels of exhaustion. And so I think we all need to take a step back and be extremely grateful for the um, onus task that teachers have really taken upon themselves um, and offer them support. Right. And what does that look like? You know, it could be professional development, not in the traditional sense, retreats, right, where they can decompress and think about, you know, what's next, what's in, you know, what's next as, as students come back, you know, and are back, um, you know, how might we engage students differently? And one of the things that I have learned, even from witnessing teachers in my own sphere, has been this incredible amount of patience with students. Um, and they have, many have been concerned with just ensuring that students love to learn, right? And so we're going to start from square one. Let's think about, you know, doing, um, you know, math and engaging in math concepts using art. We have incredible faculty that are doing fraction math, Andres Bustamante and others, um, thinking about how we support our families. And so, you know, I also think that our early childhood group, you know, Greg Duncan and um, Jay Jenkins and Stephanie Reich and many, many others are really critically thinking about how we are investing in families, how we are investing in um, communities. Because when you think about the two years, you know, preschool and preschool offerings were all over the place. Right. And quality preschool is is something we need to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. So I know that, you know, our school is definitely stepping up to the table. You probably read about many of our faculty and their amazing work um, and what they are engaging in. I encourage you to look at the incredible work that they're doing in schools every day or informing policy debates, for example, around the need to invest in our communities. Um, and what levels of investment look like and how over the lifespan of a student, it pays off. Um, and so UC Irvine is engaging in cross-cutting research. We have the Ocean Network that is in schools, the work of June On and his team and our incredible faculty that are doing that work. Um, Ocean is really having an imprint on um, our connection to schools and districts. And, and this is really what I mean by um, authentic engagement, that we are here for the long haul, that UC Irvine is invested um, in the plight of our districts. I think about Anaheim and Santa Ana, but also that we're looking to, um, we're looking at learning and how students learn differently, right? There might be some takeaways from the pandemic that we wanna keep. There might be some takeaways from the pandemic that we want to ensure, um, create more work-life balance, right? Like hybrid work, hybrid work arrangements, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one, you know, that, those are a couple of ways that we're, we're doing, you know, what, that we're engaged in. And then we have the potential to develop our programs to um, encourage teacher leaders. And so our teachers also become administrators. What are we doing as a school to cultivate that next generation of leaders in schools, district leaders, school leaders, principals. Um, and these are just incredible opportunities. I know I've met many alum from the EDD program that discuss and talk about their days and getting their EDDs. And, and these are conversations that we'll, we'll continue to have about broadening our impact. Um, what are some of the programs that 
we do have, but how might we extend our reach in cultivating this next generation of leaders? Great, thank you. I appreciate the, appreciate this insight. I appreciate that direction and providing the support of teachers. This was extremely challenging. Uh, a lot of teachers are very exhausted, you know, it's, it's, you know, very, you know, sometimes they just don't have the support and I'm glad and I'm very pleased to hear that UC Irvine is stepping up and providing this type of support for our teachers. Uh, the second question I have from the audience is, is regarding ethnic studies. Uh, so what's UCI School of Education's role in training teachers to teach ethnic studies and or advocate for equality in their school sites? This is a great question, and I am looking to models. Um, one is acknowledging, I, I know that we have, we have some expertise on our faculty, the work of Emily Penner um, and others. We have recently hired um, a colleague Julie Washington, a number of scholars that really care deeply about um, ethnic studies. They care deeply about also bilingualism. But there are some other UCs that also have programs in ethnic studies. They have certificate programs and they're having an impact on the ground. This is a tremendous opportunity that I see for the school to be present in this debate, to be present in these conversations. I think other systems have definitely played a leading role, which is fantastic. Um, the CSU system in particular has been incredibly, and some of my good colleagues have been um, really, really at the table with legislators and with the California leadership in um, really laying out ethnic studies curriculum at the high school level and in K-12 schools. All that to say, I think UC Irvine could definitely play a more significant role in being at the table. Um, and so I look to UC Riverside and their certificate program, the uh, interim dean, um, Louis, Rodriguez um, enacted this program under his tenure, and it's just a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, program that, um, of course, we're looking at as a model. Um, but again, as I mentioned, a vision is shared, and you want to make sure that you have a, a critical mass of faculty and a critical mass of faculty that are committed to this work. And so I consider this actually to be a question for the Strategic Planning Committee, um, that we are launching a strategic plan. and you know, in that process, we'll be able to determine how our programs evolve, how our programs, how we're shaping our programs um, and the degree to which we're present in these discussions and debate. Great, thank you for that. Um, and the next question is, uh, it's a bit, uh, it's more about a personal question, I guess it's asking you directly about your experience. What has been your most interesting experience you had in your career in terms of research? This is a great question and also a very tough question to answer because I've had right almost two decades of a career. Um, but I will say one of the recent experiences, uh, not recent, but relatively recent, um, was engaging with scholars across the UC system to study African-American high achievers. And it was an experience that pushed me to really think about um, allyship to really think about my role in, wow. in this conversation. And I engaged in a statewide examination. Uh, and the question was, and the question was posed to us by the then UC president, why are African-American high achievers not coming to UC, right? And so it was this broader question with a whole set of questions, but we led a statewide examination and I did it alongside Malo Hudson, who's now a Dean at the University of Virginia. Um, Eddie Como, who is at um, UC Riverside and still a very good colleague, Tonica Chapman at UC San Diego, Gloria Rodriguez at UC Davis. And here you had this cross-ethnic, cross-generational group of scholars. We were a team of 15. And we engaged in this research, but what it did provide me, honestly, was insight into um, experience as a researcher that I wouldn't have known existed right, that there are challenges, significant challenges that our African-American colleagues experience when they're engaging in research and engaging in research on the ground to inform policy. And I wouldn't have had that experience if I would have said no to the project. Um, and so I think that that was a valuable lesson. Like you're always learning something new and it was a valuable lesson also when to let go, when to say, you know, I've taken this project as far as I can, can, we think about the book and all of the pro products that come out of this work. And 
you know, I, I really think that it's improved my own role as an ally and my own insight into some of the challenges our young Black scholars experience in academia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, okay. So that covers, thank you for that. Dean Contreras, thank you for those questions, uh, answering the audience questions. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit off script. I'm going to, I have my question on my own. I'm just curious. Um, you mentioned, and this is personal, you mentioned you wanted to become a chef. I'm curious, what's your favorite dish to cook? That you, your favorite, like your well-known dish that, you, you know, when you cook it, everybody like really raves about it. Hmm. Ooh, okay, so probably my mole enchiladas. And I, I, Ryan had asked me this question about my favorite food. And frankly, any dish that has chocolate in the recipe <laughs> is like a, an added bonus. And so I think probably my mole enchiladas um, are, are a signature dish. But um, I love cooking Mexican food. And for any of you who can resonate with this, when your mom is cooking with you in the kitchen, right? They don't use recipes. And so like how I've learned to cook, I don't use recipes for Mexican food. But um, I think that's definitely one of the signature dishes. Side dish is rice. Like I have requests for my Mexican rice. Mm. Um, and so I can't share the secret ingredient, but it's definitely my Mexican rice as a side dish. But I, I think there are a host of dishes I just love to um, cook and now pass on those recipes with my daughter and her, her primas. So it's been, it's just been really great to share. Um, so for those of you that are coming to conference in San Diego, um, open invitation to host you right, when, when you're coming down for some conferences, cause I'll, I'll still retain my residence there. That, that's we'll a good way to engage the alumni. <laughs> right, right. It might be the spot of an alumni get uh, there. Salon yeah. event. <laughs> we'll have the RSVP list on the on the link on the in the chat. So, so great, awesome, thank you. Okay, well, uh, th this covers all of our questions. Um, so, thank you, Dean Contreras, for taking the time to answer the, our questions, especially from the audience. This has been a very, very enlightening, very great experience. At least to get to know you. We want to get to you, know you personally, your vision, your research, your background, what inspires you. And, I, and then you, you answered all of our questions and we just greatly appreciate the time you took and just to, just to answer our questions thoroughly and fully. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it, I'll, I'll, give, you know, I'll turn it over to you for our closing remarks. Right, I just wanna thank all of you for, um, I know tonight is a very important night. There's a State of the Union next, but I really am grateful for just the chance to impart um, some remarks this evening um, and to give you a sense of you know, where the School of Education is headed, that we're really embarking on this, this new kind of era with the school. But um, as we look forward to the next 10 years, I would love to be actively engaged with the Alumni Association, the Alumni Chapter, our students, um, because schools of education don't become top 10 right um, alone that it really does take all stakeholders at the table um, to ensure that uh, our reputation is, is solid. And you're an incredibly important part of that puzzle. So thank you so much for the questions that came in. Some of them were difficult and some of them were incredibly personal, but I greatly appreciate um, the opportunity to go back and forth and engage with you both today. So thank you all of you who stuck with us for this conversation. Thank you. I want to do one last plug for our uh, Anniers and Education Alumni um, chapter. So if you're a UCI alumni working in or retired from education or an education related field, I um, encourage you to join us. We have virtual and in-person events. Hopefully in-person will be coming back the slow roll. Um, networking opportunities and just stay connected to the School of Ed faculty and staff, including Dean Contreras. So um, the info and the link has been posted in the chat and it'll also be sent in our follow-up emails with the recording of the webinar. Thank you, Tracy. All right, well, this, uh, this wraps up our Q&A. Thank you again, Dean Contreras. Tracy, thank you. And everybody else involved, I thank you all. Thank you for joining us. Till next time.